welcome to the last lecture of the introduction to polymer physics course. In this lecture, I will go back to the Maxwell model that uh, we have been doing and we do one more example. And then we also try to conclude this entire course and uh, give you some future reading if you want to learn more uh, about the polymer physics in general. So, just to remind what we have been doing, we were doing the spring dash pot model in which we look at the response to an applied stress that give rise to different strains or amount of shear and accordingly give rise to different rates of the same and we can define the net stress because the two elements are in series. We can talk in terms of their modulus and viscosities respectively. So, this was the Maxwell model that we have been doing. So, I want to do one more example to show that why this model explains the viscoelastic behavior and the example is of a constant shear rate as opposed to a constant shear that we discussed in the last class. So, let us say instead of the shear we talk of the of the shear rate at time t equal to 0 we start applying a constant shear rate gamma gamma no, gamma naught dot so that we can write this function as gamma naught multiplied by theta t and we want to look at the response of system as a result of this particular deformation. So, again uh, instead of uh, we can look at the individual shears and shear uh, shear rate in the two elements and based on that we can look at the behavior of a system. The key point here is as opposed to the last case where we are doing a constant shear and the stress relax, relax to 0 in this case that is not going to happen because even at long times the material is flowing it is a liquid and since we are working at a constant shear rate we will have a constant stress in the end as opposed to zero stress that we had in the last class because the shear rates vanished at long times. In this case the shear rate is assumed to be constant uh, from time t higher than zero to infinite times. That is the reason we do not go to zero stress towards the end. So, with this uh, idea I can again look at this system starting from first looking at the overall shear rate that would now be sum of the shear rate in the elastic element and the shear rate in the viscous element. Just remember that when we have been doing earlier we were doing in terms of shear in the last example, now we are doing in terms of shear rates because that is what is being held constant. So, this would give us gamma dot V t as gamma naught minus gamma dot E t as we had earlier and then we can write the expression for the stresses. So, we have this equal to that. So, now for the regions that will become obvious in a moment, we are choosing to write this in terms of gamma dot minus gamma E dot 
that would simplify the analysis. So, now you work in gamma e and gamma e dot terms. In the last example, we worked in gamma v and gamma v dot terms. So, this would give me again eta v by g e and then we have gamma naught minus gamma e dot t is equal to gamma e t. This thing is again our tau. So, what we have is d gamma e by d t is equal to gamma naught minus So, we have a dot there gamma dot gamma naught dot minus gamma e divided by tau. So, if I now solve this we have d gamma e by gamma naught dot minus gamma e by tau is equal to d t which I can again integrate. And if I integrate this at time t equal to 0, the gamma e is now going to start from 0 as opposed to the last case. So, in this case, in the last case what we had was the viscous element was uh, starting from 0 sear to begin with because we were applying a constant sear. In this case, we apply a constant sear rate and so the elastic element starts from 0 and the viscous element starts from a high value. So, it is opposite of what we had in the last uh, example. So, it is 0 and then finally, we will have some gamma e t and this is my time. So, if I do the integration what we have is ln of gamma naught dot minus gamma e by tau divided by gamma naught dot is equal to t by tau from there because we will have a tau coming from the from the integration because we have gamma e by tau here. And then this is going to have the on solution what do I get is also a minus sign here. So, what we have is gamma naught dot minus gamma e by tau is gamma naught dot exponential of minus t by tau which gives me gamma e t is equal to tau gamma naught multiplied by 1 minus exponential of minus t by tau. Now, I can go ahead and find gamma e dot which is going to be gamma naught exponential of minus t by tau. So, there are cancellation of tau here and then gamma dot v of t would then be using the formula I started with. gamma naught dot exponential multiplied by 1 minus exponential of minus t by tau. So, this is what we get from here. So, we can also get the stress tensor for this case as g e 
gamma e t which is equal to g e tau gamma naught 1 minus exponential of minus t by tau equivalently we can get this as e tau v gamma dot v t which is giving me e tau v gamma naught dot 1 minus exponential t by tau and both are same because uh, we have defined eta v by g e as our tau. So, this is perfectly consistent with what we had earlier except the profiles look very different here because now we apply a constant shear rate as opposed to a constant shear. So, in this case now if I see I will have different profiles for everything. So, in now if I look at my stress, the stress is going to start from, from 0 and settle to a maximum value that is given by eta v gamma naught dot that is my sigma t. So, instead of stress relaxation, now we have a development of stress. I can do other profiles similarly. So, if I look at for example, our gamma E and gamma V. So, gamma E will start from 0 and settle to some tau gamma naught tau this will be my gamma e of t. If I look at the gamma v it is going to be just opposite of that which we can uh, get by integration. So, if I integrate this I will get the expression for gamma v t which is going to be essentially opposite of what we had for the case of gamma e and the gamma e would dot will be something like this. I guess I am not doing all the plots, but you can see that this kind of works out similar to what we had earlier. Now, I want to finally demonstrate that the Maxwell model is also consistent with the idea that uh, we have discussed that the relaxation modulus can be used to find the steady state viscosity that is the viscosity that you have at longer times. So, we want to show that that steady state viscosity is same as the viscosity of the viscous element in the case of a Maxwell model. So, for that I want to go back to the stress relaxation experiment because that is what is used to define the steady state viscosity. So, for that case the relaxation modulus is, defi is defined as the ratio of the stress to gamma naught and it turns out to be g e exponential of minus t by tau and we have defined that the steady state viscosity eta s is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of g t d t which now would be g e exponential of minus t by tau d t from 0 to infinity and this would give us g e tau exponential of minus t by tau with a minus sign 
0 to infinity which will essentially give us g e tau and since we know that the tau is the ratio of the viscosity to the modulus this is going to be the eta v which we know is the viscosity of the dashpot. So, essentially even if we started from a phenomenological model what we have been able to establish is first this very simple model explains the behavior of the viscoelastic material under different circumstances and second the parameters or the material parameters I have defined for this model holds true for the case of the steady state that we can obtain at very long times. So, therefore, the Maxwell model uh, is I would say one of the most commonly used models in the treatment of viscoelastic materials for its inherent simplicity and the fact that the we can associate meaning to the parameters that we have in the model. So, there are further extensions for uh, the Maxwell model and there are more detailed constitutive models that apply for different class of polymers. In the interest of time I am not going into the details here. So, I want to conclude my the discussion of the rheology part by saying that uh, we have a whole set of experimental tools nowadays to analyze the flow and deformation behavior of polymeric systems and we need to be able to get and we can get the constitutive laws using those experimental measures and using that constitutive law then I can finally look in detail the flow and deformation behavior of polymeric systems. So, with this uh, uh, last point I want to conclude this course on introduction to polymer physics. So, I want to just quickly recap what we have done in this course. So, we have done 3 or 4 major topics. In the very beginning we looked at the statistics of a single polymer chain in terms of random walk models which was essentially a toy model, but it contained a lot of physics and a lot of similarity to what we see in polymer chains. Then finally, we went to the thermodynamics of polymer solutions. We looked at what is known as the Flory Hudgens theory of polymer solutions. Again, it was sort of uh, a model that was like a toy model that was able to explain the thermodynamics quantities such as osmotic pressure chemical potential Gibbs free energy of the polymer solutions and also to look at the phase separation and mixing behavior of polymer chains. Then we looked at the Brownian motions of polymer chains in terms of the Langevin equation. We discussed the Rouse models, the Jim models which varied in their level of rigor. And then finally, we started looking at the flow and deformation of materials. We first reviewed the principles of continuum mechanics. We discussed how they need to be revised in the context of polymer systems. And finally, we did the rheology of polymer systems mainly looking at the experimental aspects or practical aspects of rheology as opposed to the theoretical aspects. So, uh, the polymer physics itself is a very uh, I would say a very mature field. And there is a lot more that we could not cover in this particular course. Uh, some of the interesting topics if you are further interested is the topic of self assembly of polymers particularly block copolymers. There is a lot of research going in the area of poly electrolytes. Then there is a lot of work in the in the area of biopolymers such as DNA and other molecules. Again there, there is lot of similarity with the principles we have covered in this course, but we have not really discussed the biophysical principles that works there in those cases. And uh, we tried to do the I would say significant amount of math that was required to understand the basic principles, but you must have noticed that towards the end especially in the discussion of polymer dynamics we have been rather brief for example, in the case of a gym model and the reason is like it was very difficult to pack in in this uh, in these 30 hours. If you want to learn more about the derivations that we did, 
you can refer to uh, I would say two or three books. The first reference is soft matter physics by Doi and I will give a list separately in the course. Then there is another book on introduction to polymer physics I would say that these two books pretty much cover most of the material that we have discussed in the in the class uh, in this particular course, although I have not really gone in any particular order. If you want to know more about the derivations used in the polymer dynamics part, I would refer to the book on theory of polymer dynamics. by Doi and Edwards. And finally, at times in the course we alluded to the scaling idea of dizziness and other, although in this course we did not really go into details of any of that. That is a whole another approach to look at polymer systems representing a polymer molecules as set of blobs. So, if you want to know more about the scaling theories, I would refer to the classical book Scaling Concepts in Polymer Physics by Dizziness and there is another recent book on polymer physics by Rubinstein and of course, there are many other books that you can refer to. Uh, so, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this particular course and I hope that this course uh, finds use in uh, the things that you are interested in, particularly for people who are research oriented. I would say that this is an extremely useful course because this is a rather uh, hot area in, uh, in terms of materials research. But even those who are working in industry would find use in applying these principles that we have covered in understanding certain aspects of polymer processing in industry and looking at the behavior of uh, different polymeric materials that we use in many industries such as uh, the food and packaging industries. So, with that I want to conclude the course, uh, thank you.